Good morning to all of you. Thank you very much for joining us in this new third edition of Intel Talk on regional and extraditional trade. I would like to express my, pers my, my personal view why we are presenting this, because this is a key issue for the region, and there are two key points I would like to mention. First, there's a clear impact of infrastructure, physical and digital, uh, digital infrastructure, in terms of trade. This is a very iconic uh, topic, and that puts relevance is 1% of the cost in third terms of ad valorem uh, cost can increase 8% um, trade in Latin America. We know that there's a gap in infrastructure, one of the most important indicators uh, that of the World Bank that uh, develops their logistic index in 139 countries in the world. And we see that in the 50 uh, logistic uh, performance, there, there is no uh, Latin American country. There's an infrastructure deficit in Latin America. But what we see is that this infrastructure development that needs to be developed in Latin America and the Caribbean should be sustainable infrastructure that doesn't harm the environment. And of course, it should be resilient to this greater impact the global climate change is having. And going on with the challenge we have, for example, maritime transport is very pollutant in this sense. So from integration, trade integration sector, we've been working very hard uh, on the hard and soft integration system. And the hard is this physical and digital infrastructure and should be um, inter intertwined with the regulatory uh, frameworks in technology institutions. And all this allows transport of goods and services to be more fluid and more intense. That's why they need to talk together and articulate. This topic is key, and we think that with this Intel talk, we are going to open a new access trying to understand the bond between in, the physical and digital infrastructure with the physical and this infra infrastructure and integration. Infrastructure in terms of trade is very important. And we have done a lot of work and there's research on this and global value chains in terms of trade. Of course, there's a lot of work to do in terms of the relationship between physical and digital infrastructure with inter trade integration. So we are going to try to understand these experiences and that have worked in other countries and what are the challenges and the benefits we need so we can have a better impact in terms of integration and trade. As I said before, for us, it's very important to understand and the trends in the region and outside the region, of course, what is the way we need to head for and the necessary govern governance to have better impact and boost trade and integration. And how we need to see how we can do to improve uh, railway, maritime, and all kinds of transports and also energy networks and communications and of course, digital infrastructure. And as I said before, we need to think that this development should be designed and built and operated in a way that doesn't harm the environment. Thank you very much for joining and thank you, Jose and Ana Maria for your time and your participation. We know that you have tight schedules, so thank you very much for your participation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anna, for your welcome words. 
Um, we are going to start with the first presentation, our first speaker. I'm going to introduce Ana Maria Riz Riva de Neira. She has over 10 years of professional experience and has been leading at the work of the OECD Network of Senior Infrastructure and Public and Private Partnerships official since 2018. She's a trained lawyer and worked with the Colombian administration in the field of public private partnerships, infrastructure, and public procurement. She was a capstone consultant for the Boston Consulting Group. She earned a, she earned a master degree in public administration degree from the science uh, and the London School of Economics. Thank you for being here. You have 10 minutes. Thank you, Esteban. Thank you, Anna, for your invitation. It's a pleasure to be here in this Latin America community about the work we do, and we know that it's essential for regional work. I'm going to share my presentation. And I would like to focus today on what Anna said before. It is governance. This topic is governance. Why to focus on governance and institutional design? I think these are two key elements in, for Latin America. Give me two seconds to share uh, the screen. I'm having some issues. Can you see? Yes. Well, here, why talking about governance in Latin America? Infrastructure of quality is essential to boost deve economic development, productivity, and improve uh, social welfare, and of course, sustainability issues to, to fight uh, against climate change. 30% of investment in infrastructure are lost because of inefficiency. So we have a gap in terms of the need to increase infrastructure, but we need to invest better. We need to take better decisions. Each peso, each sol, each dollar should be more efficient and productive in terms of in a context uh, in Latin America where we know that governments sometimes don't have extra resources to invest in infrastructure. So we need to allot resources in an adequate and good way. So we need to think about transport, health care, among others. What do we understand about our governance? We know that countries uh, take with infrastructure. It is a cross, um, crossing topic. Some countries have infrastructure ministries, and it requires uh, coordination among institutions, and also it requires process and a decision making process. This process of uh, decision making is essential to guarantee transparency, productivity, and predictability. Um, we have a report about institutional designs that I think it's interesting to see. For example, in some countries, Latin in Latin America, Colombia, Mexico, uh, among others, depending in this uh, and this deals with the uh, leadership and who takes the decisions. Governance not only improve procurement, public procurement, but also uh, is very important for private pub, uh, private uh, investment. So we need to see which projects are more efficient. Uh, so we need to see not uh, what uh, by inertia, we need to choose the projects correctly. 
Another thing that is key is the importance of infrastructure in terms of economic recovery, in terms of sustainability. In 2020, um, in the middle of the pandemic, we analyzed the countries and what were the plans of infrastructure. And we saw that 55% um, said that in Chile in particular, the United States decided that that was one of the pillars of economic recovery. And some other countries um, were preparing, for example, Italy and other countries focused on infrastructure as uh, an engine for economic recovery. So this essential road of infrastructure is very important, the same as uh, Chile, Ireland, focus um, this uh, idea to make better investment. And infrastructure plays an important role in sustainability and to have a more inclusive society. Most countries of the OECD said that the infrastructure plan is aligned with environmental policies. We are talking about infrastructure that doesn't harm environment. And this has been developed for 20, 30 years. In some cases, it is very important for transition. So emission um, context that is sustainable and infrastructure can help uh, biodiversity, connectivity, and new investment. And it can make it more resilient for the ecosystem. This is the uh, chart. And you can see here that the Energy Agency of the OECD estimated um, some in the last four years, in the, these four years to come in this is 2016 to 2020, real investment, one uh, trillion. And in for 2030, we need to invest four times what we have already invest, invested. So we need to do this in an efficient way. So we can get the benefits that some of the countries have got. And we have to say that the 70% is financed by private players. So we need to attract this investment so the public, the private sector can finance these uh, projects. Why governance? That was the first part. What does the OECD um, do? What we have done in 2019 is to talk about different country members, Colombia and Costa Rica um, validated these recommendations also. And what are the elements, the key elements to have good governments, good governance uh, of infrastructure? So this is done timely and with good quality. So there are different sectors from the strategic vision in the long term, uh, budget sustainability, public hiring and bidding, participation of the stockholders, coordination at all administration levels, a regulatory framework, uh, risk management, uh, the importance of having empiric information, the importance of having a long uh, cycle development, not just the pre-investment stage. And uh, last but not least is infrastructure resilience for the provision of uh, public services. This is a general outlook. We are going to share the link with you so you can see good practices in each of those elements. I would like to focus on the three first. So these are the indexes and where the OECD countries are in each of those pillars. And what are the areas 
that require more uh, work, let's say. This is a summary of uh, the different elements. Let's go on with the indexes. The objectives, we need to map strengths and weaknesses. We need to contribute to the discussion between results and governance to see different dimensions and in terms of information available because some countries uh, need, uh, some make changes and we need to get that information. I would like to focus on the three pillars that we saw because I think they are very important for Latin America. When we see the first pillar, there are different trends. In general, countries have 0.53% on average, where different topics to improve are. Even though some countries have a long-term plan to improve this, there are other elements that are some uh, challenges. So the idea is uh, how, can, how we can match these plans with the budget so as to be able to make these plans a reality. So we need to see the functional design and the objectives because sometimes it's not always um, linked to finance objectives. This is the second, this is time for money. We have had good results in Colombia and, and other countries. And they worked hard um, to get time for money. But there are some areas that require a lot of attention. And it is this information is very important to have a good discussion for contracts and to have um, time and uh, budget um, projects, within budget projects. Then we have contingency sometimes, uh, liabilities, and some countries need to improve. And if we see the last element, which are public purchases, we have Korea, Canada, United Kingdom, which have made a lot of effort to improve their practices in terms of public purchases. And for instance, the United States is an entirely centralized country. We can see that in its indicators, but there are other countries that require uh, for their attention, especially in areas such as a strategic use of uh, public um, fighting processes, such as uh, green um, elements and ink processes. We see these uh, in charts in which we see that other countries have very high scores in their uh, work uh, forces and some of them are making an even higher effort to improve these procurement processes. So if we're going to have a further analysis, we're going to provide the link about the OEC, uh, the OECD uh, toolkit so that you can see these dynamic uh, specialties in the studies and we can see what the OECD is doing in the use of natural resources, for instance, to build infrastructure and uh, climate change is in the center of the analysis. I just wanted to make a summary of some of the results and to show the importance of uh, infrastructure, uh, public procurement, especially uh, in this uh, section of Latin America. As to OECD support in order to strengthen um, the infrastructure governance, we continuously support member countries and non-members through uh, governance about infrastructure and public-private association studies. Um, among most recent studies, we have Italy, Ireland, Czech Republic, among others, and also Argentina, Chile, Mexico, 
and other countries. So you are welcome to um, check on them. And as to um, the infrastructure events, and the next one is going to be held in April 2024 in uh, Paris. So you can uh, probably take part of them. And we have also another uh, type of tools that have been developed in order to improve the available information for investments and citizens about infrastructure projects which uh, do not only look at countries but different stages and criteria in order to have a good infrastructure projects which is an initiative that has been uh, taken by us and japan canada and other countries of the EU, eu and last but not least we have other uh, data and case studies at the toolkit that we were mentioning before, which contributes to a better understanding of these topics. So that would be it. Thank you for your attention, and I am available to answer any questions that you may have. Great. Thank you, Ana Maria, for your interesting presentation. It's been very concise and very uh, accurate. So thank you very much. I have some questions through the different channels that are open. One comment is or question is related to how OECD is working on risks and contingencies as to the impacts from climate catastrophes in the area, which are increasingly frequent. This is something that has been seen by investigators and researchers in the area. So how is OECD working on that? Thank you. This is a very important question because in the past we used to talk about eventualities or eventual risks, but now they are no longer eventual, but increasingly severe. So we are working on resilience and that would be a core topic of the forum that will be held in April. So it will be interesting to see different trends for from countries. One of them is the use of nature-based solutions the infrastructure green or gray infrastructures might be complementary or sometimes might replace for, in, for instance in uh, coast uh, erosion and harm was actually protected by gray infrastructure so uh, we have green infrastructures or other kinds of infrastructures that are more resilient than gray infrastructures. So we need to think how they might be seen as the, an alternative solution, but also as complementary or supplementary solutions. One of the studies that you might find in the toolkit is a dam that is a water dam uh, for water, uh, for energy production hydraulic production, but within that dam, there's an entire mapping of green neighboring areas that are essential, not only for the dam itself, but also for the entire ecosystem. So the idea was not only to protect it, but also to make production in the long term more efficient for the entire water flow. Uh, in the dam that is in the Emilia Romagna uh, region in Italy. So this is an example of nature-based solution. Uh, something we've been working on is long-term planning, such as uh, adaptation strategies that in general are developed in the area of the environment ministry 
and they are not necessarily taken to the infrastructure planning, housing or transport ministries. So we need to further coordinate them at the government levels in order to uh, have resilience included in infrastructure long term planning. And something else is to see how to include this during the project prioritization processes. So there's been an entire cost benefit analysis of how to include these um, elements in the uh, infrastructure project prioritization, but also uh, and something we can talk about after the seminar, the cost benefit analysis to build protection infrastructure. It's not as including the elements of a bridge or a train uh, railroad, but how to include protection infrastructure projects that are enabled to protect other infrastructures in the area. So these are some of the topics we been working on at a high level and that will be core topics for the forum in April and we're creating and drafting some reports on these areas that I hope to be sharing and publishing in May next year. Great, thank you. Ana Maria and Another question that we are receiving is related to uh, governance best practices in OECD. What's the experience of Latin American countries as to those indicators? So are they reaching OECD average scores? And how are they related to these measures? Well, we have um, different outcomes and results. We have scores from Mexico, and now we have indicators from other OECD countries. And certainly one of the topics to improve is strategic planning, for instance, in Peru. I think there's been an emphasis in midterm planning. Most countries have some kind of development plan, government plan, and there's been a lot of investment in mid -plan, midterm planning, but we're still finding some issues as to long term planning in order to address, for instance, climate change, but also they are important in order to set, to draw a um, line not to, that is not modified according to political changes. So Colombia, there's an, uh, is another case of a very interesting planning uh, perspective that has been followed up in the last couple of years. Maybe Nico can talk about other um, best practices in that sense, but I think is that's an area that in Latin America we need to work on uh, something that are, is related to sustainability in Colombia, in Chile. Those are countries that have been worked have been working really hard in these topics. Also, many Latin American countries have um, ranked and scored very, very well in anti-corruption areas, and they have a very strong anti-corruption structure, at least in governance. We should see how effective those strategies are in practice. But that would be a general outlook of how member countries or Latin American countries are compared to other member countries in OECD. And last question that we received is whether OECD has any example of infrastructure investment from member countries that has reached some efficiency in cross-border dimension impacts. That is to say, if integration 
has an impact on that infrastructure with, with a positive uh, impact in that dimension. I think that in the European case, there are great examples of infrastructure requiring connectivity. There are some examples not from the OECD, but I can certainly share some examples in um, land uh, ground transport in Europe that are key for transportation among European uh, countries that can be an example for Latin America. So thank you. Thank you for your insights. And now we are going to introduce our second speaker. Jose Barbero is an expert in the area of transport policy, planning, regulation and management and infrastructure in general. He has more than 30 years of experience in the public and private sectors in his home country, Argentina, and in numerous Latin American countries. He pursued postgraduate studies in transport economics and planning at the University of Toronto and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. From 2003 to 2008, he worked at the World Bank as senior transport specialist in the areas of infrastructure, transport and logistics with special focus on Latin America and the Caribbean. He currently works as a lecturer and researcher at the University of San Martí, Argentina, and has an independent consultant, consultant on transport issues. So he's one of the main reference in um, the region. So he's going to uh, talk about the different links in that sense. So thank you for being here. You have the floor. Thank you. So first of all, I'm going to share my screen. Please let me know if you can see that. So first of all, thank you to Intel for inviting me. I think it's a very important moment to discuss these topics. I'm going to talk about infrastructure, but in a very specific approach, which is related to cross-border integration within the general agenda and specifically talking about South America. It could be the same for uh, the Caribbean or Central America, but uh, I'm going to talk about, first of all, the progress that have, has been made during the last 20 years, and then to see what's going on in other parts of the world, not as much in developed countries, but also in developing countries where there's been a lot of progress in integration and a lot of lessons learned from them. And finally, to talk about some conclusions about topics that I consider are key to relaunch, sort of say, the agenda during the next coming years. So uh, I've been working with the ITB, with ILAT, the Alliance for the Integration and Development of Latin America and the Caribbean, and there's a lot of work that has been done, and now I'm working with uh, other techniques about integration and experiences of, of physical integration in other uh, parts of the world, especially in developing countries. So starting with some concepts, regional integration is, of course, a process through which different states share uh, decisions aiming at 
uh, obtaining ben mutual benefits and, and that those decisions have different dimensions, commercial integra um, trade integration, uh, physical integration, digital integration. And one of the components of that integration is, as I was saying before, physical and digital integration. So the idea is to set some updates on that, which is the one that provides digital connectivity, which is uh, paramount to actually consider other aspects. And the results of that integration uh, infrastructure is key, key in a broad sense of the world, not only as to works and physical uh, works, but also services and their regulatory frameworks that regulate uh, those services. So I think that's the vision and the perspective we need to consider about infrastructure. So talking about South America, if we look at the history and the background of each of our countries, probably in the future, we will see that in the year 2000, there was a turning point with uh, the beginning of an in regional integration initiative. Before that, there were other interesting cases. But this initiative, the Initiative for the Integration of Regional Infrastructure in South America, IIRSA, implied a turning point, which was sort of collective action. Brazil had a lot of uh, leadership in this. There was an interesting planning work. There's been a lot of support from countries, uh, presidents of the region would attend different meetings, so they would be working on that. There was an action plan that made those ideas to be implemented, and there was a, a significant role of multilateral agencies, while well, the IDB had an impact on this. So the good performance of the initiative was a uh, key. Well, the structure of IRSA was the integration axis. M most of you know what I'm talking about. There are nine egg axes, and within these are the uh, the builds of the um, this construction that are T. Is seven and each of them has five four uh, projects with a lot of synergy among them and it is supposed that they will integrate and get the benefits and then we have individual projects that are around 600 depending on the agenda and this is the agenda that has been developed and improved and in IRSA we paid attention to that soft component. They were at the beginning of the agenda and then they lost importance. Um, they were not paid a lot of attention. And that is one of the aspects we need to improve. These are the axes, these nine axes with different territories. They don't cover countries, but just parts of different territories of different countries. And on the right, we have the evolution of the project portfolio that can be improved. So, and that was improved in 20, uh, 2000, we started and then UNASUR was created uh, in 27 and it was absorbed by the council. And this was interesting because we went on with the same way of working. There were some adjustment, but we need to see this process of IRSA or C plan that took around two decades. They, they were almost 20 years 
of uh, important progress in this uh, portfolio. In the report I was mentioning to you, there's detailed uh, analysis of all this. If we can uh, have an analysis of all this, there were a lot of strengths, political participation, the bank support, and the in, um, development bank support, and this idea of going to COSI plan in a political different diff different uh, political context, and that showed kind of sound context. Of course, uh, we have the challenges, and we need to improve these weaknesses. Um, not all projects. Uh, were um, had good quality. Uh, others, some were good. Some others were not good. There was kind of uh, consensus uh, voluntarism. Some countries proposed one thing. Some others proposed other things. There was a lot of emphasis on economic, social, and environment, environmental development we need to go back to the year 2000. There was a kind of bias against it or towards transport because some associations were already discussing these issues. And a little bit of telecommunication, uh, hydric resources uh, was not even on the agenda. And there were some biased uh, also about investment uh, works that that was soft agenda that I mentioned before. And uh, there was a trend towards big projects and big, we generally pay attention to big corridors where a lot of um, cars and vehicles can um, transport or can drive. I think, what does the, sh the world show us? It's important to focus here, and we haven't done this in Latin America lately, because in the over the last 10, 15 years, there has been progress, in, and not in Asia and Africa also, there has been projects even though the there were there there ha, has always been difficulties and this these corridors of integration integration corridors for physical connectivity rails and access to uh, mediterranean uh, areas integration of electric systems sometimes the market rules for um, dismiss of uh, woods and digital integration, for example, uh, overlaying of uh, optic fiber. And uh, now we have um, this on the agenda and also hydric uh, basins. And we need to include this in the agenda. And of course, regional multilateral banks uh, have had a very active role, the ABD, uh, the Islamic Development Bank, and also the World Bank, and some others, and they participate a lot. And of course, other associations that countries form, and there are other uh, stakeholders. What do these actions show? Uh, physical integration is very hard as a prerequisite for regional integration. Uh, other dimensions cannot be achieved if we don't have physical and digital, physical uh, con connectivity, for example, electricity, networks, and of course, digital uh, deals with the information institutional architecture. Here we have very diverse uh, ways uh, that are based on international agreements. Here is a little bit of the soft part. What we have seen also is 
attention to spatial and uh, territorial impact and the geographical dimension of the space. And I think we need to pay attention to this in Latin America. And going back to South America and this new era, because I think the, we can have a new birth, a new beginning, because Brazil is interested in this, not the same, but something that uh, hits or goes in the same direction. There's a gap now because of this plan, because uh, ECOSI plan, we don't need to do the same. We don't have to do the same. We need to cover those or meet those objectives. What are the ambition levels we should have? Is uh, an axis of physical integration. Those axes needs to be sustainable development axis to develop in the, the area to develop the region, but we need to go forward on that issue. And then there is a third component that uh, hasn't been on the agenda, is to have common positions in international uh, forums, uh, in the International Maritime, Maritime Organization. The idea of overcost to freight is something that has a lot of impact for Latin, South America. So there we need to have more actions, we need to coordinate more actions and in other topics related to this disruptive uh, aspect in infrastructure. Some proposals that appear in this uh, document, three different um, aspects, Pla planning, we need to carry out this agenda. And so the other two can be done, the implementation, for example. And in terms of planning, looking at South America, someone can revise the nine axes we have, and they are really very flexible. But it is worthwhile revising those axes to have a deeper analysis so we need to deal with the consensus, but we, now we need to apply a more strict methodology, a reassessment, a more rigorous reassessment to see the projects that would, uh, would improve regional integration. And then at the project level, we need to reevaluate all these in every project. There are different issues here. I would like to convey this. One is the quality of the projects. If you, in 2010, if we uh, if we can see that and you can have a word count, at that time, 2010, the the trend word was gap, and we have done some exercises and. At that time, how much in, uh, investment uh, did we need? We need to multiply this. But if we did the same exercise in 2015, 2018, there was a change there. Because at that time, we tried to invest uh, better through different banks, the IDB, the other banks, and they converged with the same, they understood that with the same resources, we could do better things in terms of uh, choosing the projects, the infrastructure, among other things. We need to see different ways of using the resources in a better way. Today, we have this quality infrastructure, the certifying process, external revision mechanisms. And I think we need to go in that way to improve the portfolio and try to avoid this white elephant. 
so as to have the impact we want. Uh, I already spoke about hard and soft aspects. We need to take into account social environmental aspects and this is important. And of course, productive local process and how that impacts on the territory and in terms of evaluation. And we need to crack down here to get more benefits. But I think we need to look for more sophisticated methodology, not partial balance, but indirect impact, broad impact, so as to have a final impact that is better. And we need to uh, link the objectives regarding what we want to do. And how do we link this with sustainable development goals? I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of work to do here in terms of the, this territorial look. So we need to see all the plans in the space as we have uh, everything uh, drawn on a map. So we need to unify sec sectorial uh, politics and, and integrate this with the, project, the IDB in 2009, um, put a lot of emphasis on spatial uh, policy and not a lot was taken, it was carried out. So we need to go on working hard on the special, sorry, special, special dimension, special, uh, the, the, the territory dimension. I think that integ physical integration is worthwhile. So countries bet on this and uh, work on this structure. I'm going to be very brief implementation is all an area in itself and it's complex so we need pre investment design private and public participation we need to create and generate uh, incentives and of course the organization is um it's long and uh, we would need another talk. So if we want a physical integration agenda, a lot of countries should come together. They should have an agenda, organization issues, and um, carry it out in a strategic way as the plan did. Maybe we could have something in between. Sometimes uh, countries are uh, enthusiastic, but the projects are not um, good enough. These are the problems and how we solve these problems uh, goes beyond this talk. I think we need to include uh, the global forum look, uh, we need to include that in the agenda uh, where countries have a lot to tell about their own experience. And this is the end of my presentation. Thank you, Jose, for your presentation. It was really very uh, interesting on your South American a view for the infrastructure and physical integration. We have some questions here. Many questions related to this relationship between the public and private sector in these infrastructure projects. And for example, one question is if, can you enumerate some of the projects that have the public-private participation that have had impact on trade in South America? Yes, in terms of the public-private participation, we have had 30 years of experience to, to take conclusions, to have conclusions, and we have had uh, successes and failures uh, I think this is 
a very important uh, point, a uh, private infrastructure. For example, if you see infrastructure, uh, 80%, around 80% is private investment. And there are private companies that um, they connect internet and generally uh, there are other areas that are uh, not protected and are not covered. So if you go to the energy sector, private participation is big, but in terms of uh, energy creation, private investment to sell uh, energy is a, a common place in the world. And that works really well in terms of a distribution a network, a, it has less, uh, there is less investment. But um, when you go to transport, for example, the outlook is different because there are certain activities that predominate more than others. In terms of ports, there, there was a trend in terms of private investment. In roads, that is reduced to some roads to urban uh, corridors. It's difficult that a private investor uh, invests there. So generally, that is absorbed by the state with some mechanisms with third party uh, third parties, because generally the particip public participation is less. And in terms of water, in terms of potable supply of water, uh, there we have a private participation in um, sunning or it's evident that uh, the, the, the business is not so good. In telecommunication, energy, transport and water, is uh, there's a lot of private investment. There's another question that is related to, for instance, each country needs to set priorities and national projects. So the question is, what are the best possible methods to set priority on infrastructure investments that drive uh, integrated infrastructure projects in, in the region? Sometimes um, there are projects where um, international agencies take part are the ones that are most efficient. Well, I take two conclusions from that que question. Uh, so first, how do you coordinate and different uh, projects from a national perspective to cross-border areas? So we need to have some approach that go beyond borders. So there are be benefits associated to those projects. Many projects that are related to integration in those countries are also related to an improvement in and domestic flows in each country. For instance, we can uh, take the uh, IIRSA uh, road projects and that was connecting Pacific Ocean going to the Andes and going towards the Amazon region connecting Peru and Brazil so what the idea of um, that huge work was uh, so Peru, for instance, during raining seasons were completely uh, destroyed. So uh, trade was improved between Brazil and Peru. That was another expectation, and especially in the Amazon area. In Portobello, there was an uh, increased uh, trade uh, movement. So that would be regional integration. And then the second idea was that Brazil would make exports through the Pacific. So that was not actually uh, concreted. 
or seen. So we need to see in the assessment methodologies what are the real goals and to focus on them so that they are and uh, the procedures are aligned with the goals. These are topics that we could spend hours talking about. Another question we received is whether you think that the uh, reduced progress in this region are related to the short demand or that and the poor uh, infrastructure or limiting commercial uh, exchanges. Well, when you see integration projects at the regional level, you will find some that aim at increasing improvements and capacities where there are demands and others are related to strategic uh, points where there are where there is no demand and we expect to generate some demand. So in the first case, there are some uh, corridor between Brazil, Argentina and Chile. Today we see a long line of tracks, for instance, in that area. So there we already have demand. There are a lot of demands and there are some flaws there and there's another corridor for instance a different corridor which is the bio oceanic um, corridor that covers um, uh, the south of brazil paraguay and chile and we expect to generate new flows flows that are non-existent today and this argument of actually set pave the way for uh, generating new demand might be right in some cases and wrong in others. So we might propose huge works with uh, no later impact whatsoever. So we need to be really careful when providing advice and we still have a lot of uh, projects to cover demands that are currently in place and that are not met yet. One last question is related to political economy in the organization of South American infrastructure from uh, the empirical or empiric experience from the last couple of years. And I think that integration systems within a regional context of political heritage sphere where there's a lot of differences or in similar contexts where there are groups or alliances such as the Mercosur and others of the kind. So how do you think that's the perspective. Well, I think that the South American uh, perspective is the right one. For instance, in Africa, they have seven subregions and there are in internal or domestic agreements. And because of the geography, I think it's right to consider it from the South American first perspective. There are some from the south cone, other from um, the north of Brazil, other from the Andes. So I think that we have many shared points. Also, the, the, the big size of Brazil makes that possible. But we need to see what kind of organization we have. IIRSA was a great experience, I think everything that was actually done and the progress that was made. UNASUR had a kind of heavy scheme with many secretariats and 
many people move away from that. So I think we need to find a balance scheme, not too light or too heavy, but to implement policies in different countries because we need to, we, we don't need for all the planets to be aligned in order to have regional consistencies, regardless there are uh, offices in place, there are all governments and administrations in place, but I think we need to go beyond that. And it's difficult, it does require some efforts and some uh, possibility to make them um, real and in that sense we have the support from the IDB that might have a very significant role but then we need to really work on them with uh, meetings and uh, being together and talking about that and working on them so I think that that might be a, a really significant role in that process. Thank you, Jose. We have some minutes left, and I would like to ask both Jose or Ana Maria if you want to add anything to the things that have been mentioned as to governance and OECD structure or what Jose presented. So we have some minutes left, so if you want to add anything or to answer other questions? We have some minutes left. I would like to go back. I think it seemed that we agreed with Jose with our presentations, but I want to say that we prepared them separately. But what I was mentioning before that we see indicators when we compare members that are some leaders in the region, Chile, Colombia. There are huge gaps in planning and project prioritization. And when we compare planning processes in the region and in other countries, in other OECD member countries, we've seen that the planning process at an institutional level, we see that in governance sense, there's a planning ministry. So planning role has left the framework where uh, there's an entire ministry, There's it's an internal process in the sector, and that has been seen when those planning roles are not necessarily uh, in contact with a project. So that's one of the main flaws when it comes to long-term planning, which is key in regional integration and in infrastructure and de development at a country level. So I think that's one of the most important conclusions and one of the main elements that we need to continue working in the region. Jose, any last comment? I think that I talked too much already. Thank you, both of you. It's been a very encouraging talk. And as Anna mentioned in the beginning, one of the key access in the integration and trade in Latin America. This is an access that we've been working uh, really hard on from Intel. Before closing, I want to mention, give you some piece of information on, on December the 30th in the um, Young People Network in Intel, we are holding an interesting talk about AI in order to drive trade at the regional level. There's going to be specialists from the IDB 
Sosua Metzer from uh, the UGIC Institute, and we want to show the main progresses of a study that is called Latin America in Movement for this new technological transformation era. So you are all invited to this activity that will be held on December the 13th. So we're going to close on the webinar. I want to thank Ana Maria Ruiz, who has accepted the invitation to this webinar. Jose, it's always a pleasure listening to you. So with this, we conclude. Mm -hmm.